I think we, we talked about that um, like uh, open access science will uh, the benefit will be time and efficiency. On the other hand, we heard that the biggest factors that work against it is the economic, economic factor. And what would um, you answer people who say like like money and reputation will always be um, the strongest benefits that will um, slow down this development? What do, you, what do you ask to somebody who says it will never work, it's utopia because um, there's too, too much money and too much uh, like this power aspect behind it. Um, yeah. 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 Okay, well, I mean, there's a, the question is how you, how you put value onto open access publications. You can do this, so it can be of value for scientists to publish openly. So this is a political decision. And then the question is how you measure the impact of such a publication. And in the moment this is done by one company, who is, only, who is the only company that has access to citation measure, uh, citations in the papers, because of the, the companies, publishing companies only give it to this company. If this would be all open, easily Google or whatever kind of computer infrastructure could calculate new measurements for the scientific impact of something. And we could have different kinds of impact measurements starting from likes of other scientists towards more standard measurement of citation measurements, for example. And the difference is we can discuss which one is good, which one reflects in which field of science the real impact or somehow the real impact it's always it's a philosophical question in the end for the scientific impact. But as she said from the German Research Foundation, is that we have to have some measurements to distribute our money, our taxpayers' money to scientists. Okay, some objective measurements. But at the moment we stick to very few measurements that are calculated by a privately run company. Yes. And yeah, yes. okay. Uh, okay, okay. So, uh, yeah, so it's Thompson, Easy Web of Science, and they sell it for a lot of money, and they have this, this unique position because they, these are the, the only companies that has access to the citations of papers, which, which, which in an open access world, this would be not the case. Thompson, yeah. Thompson, Thompson. Yeah, and this is a political decision, for example, by the German Research Foundation to accept this and to keep stick with it in the future. And and there are some stakeholders and some constructs you can imagine and uh, that might prevent this but we are in the situation of changing this now okay because if you have open access publications other companies and other people could easily calculate some impact factors okay. uh, this this question what if every publication was open so to speak that you just posed yeah, I yeah. think it's not a philosophical, philosophical question for a publishing house at all Louis, <laughs> yes. okay. quite, quite a severe question for you. What if all the publishing, no, all, all the journals were open? Um, how do you see that? Is that, um, is that a realistic scenario? And if yes, um, how would you react? I don't think, and I think we've already touched on this earlier, I don't think we're going to see the role of um, publishers disappearing. However it is that we evolve our publication models, so we're always going to need some form of gatekeeper, some kind of filter um, of getting to information. And I think, you know, it may be that we end up with more information, it may be that that information is more widely dispersed, it may be that that information is published under different models, but we're still going to need a, a way of filtering through that, of finding um, things by specific areas of, of rating and ranking things. Maybe it, it won't solely be the um, publishers alone that are deciding which things have an impact. I mean, one of the, the things about social media is that it is social. It, it is about everybody who chooses to interact with it. So it may be that the, the net, net is cast wider and that there are more opinions from different scientists being able to comment on things and, and feedback about how they rate papers and what they find interesting. I think um, 
probably everybody's aware of the, the recent Arsenic Life story. So this was effectively post-publication peer review that was taking place out in the open, out in public. And um, we've seen some interesting things happen um, around publishing and because of that. And we've seen some very interesting conversations. And I think things like that are only going to continue to evolve. And I don't think any publishers are anticipating that, that we're going to stay where we are now. Yeah, funding bodies aren't the only institutions which um, have to measure the relevance of scientific uh, results or certain scientific um, activities. Journalists more or less do the same if you want. They also have to see how important is this, how, um, how timely is it, we are actual and so on. Um, to which extent do you think social media adds another an additional um, research possibility and option to journalists? Um, for instance, if you, if you look at Twitter and you see that a certain research result has been retweeted 10 times, 100 times, 1,000 times, is that a measure already that you can um, put beside the number of published articles or um, citations or uh, impact factor? There's, a very, um, uh, there's an article, a research article, who showed that, um, who tried to characterize how important Twitter is and it was for research and journalism, if I remember correctly. I got, um, I went through this publication with Miriam Mecke from the uh, University of St. Gallen, who's working also on scientific communication um, and online communication. And you could see that um, um, the number of followers is irrelevant. So how many followers you have is not relevant. It's more relevant how many times you were cited and how many times your name was cited in in this larger network. And I think, but. but I, I think we should uh, bring this question to, the, to you because you are the journalist. Um, what do you think? Is this bringing you a, a new, new layer which helps you to find the information faster or is it just getting more, f it's getting more fog into the, into the room and you don't know <laughs> which information you want to have and which information is maybe not the right one? My question to you. I think reputation with all these things continues to be important. So we see, you know, with Twitter, there's a lot of noise about it. There's a lot of conversations. We know that, that a lot of people are using it to talk about various things. But what's also interesting in recent months is that we are seeing things like clout, like peer index, which are reputation ranking tools popping up. And these are allowing users to, um, in some cases, um, cloud, for example, to rate other users to say which areas of expertise they think that the particular people tweeting have. And that then helps perhaps journalists maybe coming in to, to sift through this information to see who it is online in these environments that are perhaps seen as um, authoritative, at least amongst their peers online. I mean, there's obviously problems with this too. Um, like with anything, there's, there can be gamification is a word that people are using a lot at the minute. So you can get an echo chamber effect. You can get people rating their friends so that their friends rate them back and, and so on. But, but it is all very social now. Yeah. What do you think? Uh, so far, you've, you've heard about all this now for almost two hours. What is your searching for? <laughs> Sorry? It's weniger Mühe. Okay. It's, she says it's, it's less effort to read the journal um, in the first place. Yeah. Okay. For me, it's a game for the social networks to find the information, which I, which I interesting for me, uh, if you all know this, uh, I, I don't need it. So it's a main problem I have, also other networks. <laughs> So I, I, I had the same problem, and but it's the same problem with all the news groups, all the blog posts in the internet, everything. And just you can just apply the strategies that you use in real world within within social networks uh, for scientists as well. And there are some Twitter like um, she mentioned, like some cloud sourcing, like some like features, uh, some new news feed generating algorithms and some tools that build on Twitter. So 
in the in the same way like social networks for scientists will develop in the future that they pick um, according to your likes in the past to the to the people that you follow that you get a more comprehensive selection of all the information that are in the network which is uh, the long term goal of for example Facebook to become your only news source or Twitter so it is a very comprehensive very useful news feed for you you just get the information that you're interested in this is it is learning by itself so this is one approach like Google does already for you you, you maybe you didn't recognize but if you log in into Google or you, you Google from the same IP all the time from your home computer, it adapts, or from your work computer, it adapts to your search, uh, your search results to the results that you had clicked in the past, that you clicked in the past, you know, so it gets more and more useful for you, which this is of, of course dangerous, but it is another topic too. Okay, this is uh, overall society political question in the end. But the same thing can be realized for science. I, I mean, we are all quite enthusiastic about it and positive. I think um, just maybe to to play the devil's advocate for a minute. Uh, I, I wrote a blog posting on uh, um, academic search engine optimization a few weeks ago. I think it was two or three weeks ago, and got quite severe criticism as well um, uh, about it because people were arguing that this is also a distortion of the classical form of um, calculating and impacts and impact factors because what some um, academics manage to do nowadays they drive their publications up in the search rankings and up in the in the search results from maybe uh, position number uh, 87 to number three it's the same publication it's the same title it's the same metadata but it's suddenly it's up in the ranking only because they managed to well let's say manipulate uh, the the search engine optimization if you want yeah. so they have for one scientist who knows how to do it and he's in in he's got a big advantage and there you've got the other scientist who's not interested in it or who doesn't know anything about it who doesn't have the time to, share, to, to, to care about it and he's got this disadvantage already now, not tomorrow not, not next year, but it's already happening now and that's a discussion whether but I mean you can't stop it, it's a, it's a process that has already begun and uh, it's academic so to speak, academic to discuss it yeah. but, um, uh, is, that, is that a criticism yet that you are confronted with as well? Or? Um, in research games, the user doesn't have to think about search engine optimization. Um, the articles and the comments <laughs> he's making, um, the things what he's doing within ResearchGate, are getting automatically exposed to Google based on how many clicks, how recent it is, um, how many people looked at it. So it's somewhere a natural distribution around the articles itself, which then all getting at, at the you know, same way exposed to Google. Um, I know that people, this is our case, but of course you cannot do anything against people who are having their own website and doing this search engine optimization on their own. Yeah. But a publication in ResearchGate, doesn't it have a positive impact, uh, positive effect on the impact already? Which means that if you have a publication in ResearchGate, isn't that worth more than that publication that is not in ResearchGate? This is why we're trying to have all the publications very soon in, in ResearchGate, and it's yeah. it's it's not that hard to do that because yeah. there are so many databases, databases al already aggregating the data. Mm -hmm. So it's more a question of manpower to do all the different mm -hmm. things at the same time. Mm -hmm. uh, we just um, we just including we have OI, we have DOA. J, we have IEEE, we have Sites here, we have Cornell Library, we have the NASA Library, we have PubMed. So we have around 11 databases already and we're adding more. Mm -hmm. I think that's why we're trying to have all the databases and all the publications at the same level within ResearchGate, exactly not to have one comp you know, advantage for one scientist because he knows how to use uh, you know, these strategies to optimize the search engine results pages.